and I'm very honoured to be asked to be part of this. And I hope uh, that this is something that carries on well into the future. Of course, uh, her legacy is there anyway. It's in print in many ways, but uh, this, of course, is a tribute. And uh, David mentioned before, and I think it's so true, when people pass on, we have our own memories of them. Uh, and, and he said she's known, she's known in the family as a bit of a rat bag, which I think is probably appropriate. And I think that that sense of humour and love of life has come across in her work as well. So uh, I, won't, I won't hold up with uh, my speeches, because I know we all want to hear from Claire Martin. Uh, but I will, of course, uh, welcome firstly uh, for our welcome to country, country to be called uh, to the podium. Uh, good evening, everyone. <laughs> My name is uh, Major Lumen, Tibi Kual. I'm an elder, Daraba, spokesman, the Dangalaba clan. We are the Dangalaba clan with the, being the Kalambirindian people or tribe. The Dangalaba clan are recognised as the traditional owners from way back in 1973 to 75 when we had um, land claim success in um, the Kalaluk in the Henry Point land claim from my uh, Daraba, Nairi, grandparents made land claims in um, Darwin and they, um, after a long fight, they had uh, success so the good thing is that um, we have recognition as traditional owners through Justice Woodward and um, Justice Ward. Um, so that's history. Um, we um, also had um, a few land claims that um, in Cox, Pinsley and Darwin, but um, they were unsuccessful, unsuccessful at the time. But um, we are still uh, fighting for our, our land rights today, back in the courts today, in the federal court. So it's, for me, it's been a lifetime and uh, a fight too that is ongoing for our family's sake. But, uh, they recognise uh, their recognition of Trishlanas, of three families, of the clan, Duncan Lava clan. That'll, is the Tommy Lyons group and uh, the secretaries and um, the Batjo family. We have a long history, our family, the Batjo family. Because uh, once upon a time they used to, my grandparents used to live in um, McDonald's camp down in Cullen Bay, where they used to look after the area for ceremonies and <coughs> business on top of the main ceremony grounds. One of my grand uncles had to, not had to, but he joined the army and was in the 11th Light Horse Cavalry and um, went overseas and fought there and came back and then they established uh, the um, Carlin compound. So that area is particular to our families, the great significance to our Aboriginal laws and customs. And I say good evening also to our guests, Claire Martin, former NT Chief Minister, Dr. David Ritchie, David Fricker, Director, General National Archives, Louise Doyle, Sean Rowlock, National Archives, Charles Darwin University Executive, members of the NT History Fraternity and countrymen, ladies and gentlemen. Hmm. So as I said before, I'm a Dunkelab Cullen Brinton person from my mother, my grandmother, great grandmother, great great grandmother. All the women on my mother's sides were Cullen Brinton Dunkelab people. And as um, we recognise in the NAIDOC this year that um, of the women's um, past and of their achievements, and, and so is my uh, families on the ladies' woman side have achieved today. As we are gathered on our country, Cullenbrink and Hattery, our stories, the images, voices, and fingerprints of my 
mother and her family and the collections of National Archives of Australia and being safeguarded and shared and, ex and accessible for my children and our future generations and other people. So we too are connected as to anyone who has a connection to Australia, both people, government, land and shared histories. I acknowledge the significant contribution of Mickey Dewar Good stories, history, Dharma. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tibby, for that. Welcome to country. Now I'd like to welcome David Frickham, Director General from the National Archives of Australia, for his introduction. Thank you very much, Christy, and I do need to put my glasses on for this, so I'd better do that. Um, thank you very much, Tibi, as well, for that, uh, that welcome to country and for the, the time you take to share those stories with us. And as a visitor here today from Canberra, uh, can I tell you it's a privilege to be able to come here and, and hear those stories from you, so thank you very much for that. Um, former Chief Minister, Ms Claire Martin, the Honourable Michael Grant, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Dr. David Ritchie, uh, Christy O'Brien, our Master of Ceremonies, um, uh, Patrick Gregory, uh, Senior Director from Libraries, Archives and Northern Territory Government, uh, and also a special welcome to Josie Petrick, uh, a youthful 94-year-old Josie Petrick, who's a very dear friend of uh, Mickey, Mickey's as well. So welcome to you, Josie, and thank you so much for being here this evening. Also, other representatives here from the Commonwealth Public Service, the Northern Territory Public Service, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, may I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet this evening, and I also pay my respects uh, to elders past and present uh, and acknowledge their continuing uh, culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and the region and indeed to our nation. Uh, and I also pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are here with us this evening. It's always good to get away from a chilly Canberra morning to come up and enjoy the beautiful weather here in Darwin, but today, is, of course, it's a very, very special occasion and a very special source of enjoyment for me uh, as we're here to, to join together for this inaugural Dr Mickey Dewar oration uh, and giving me the opportunity to share just a few brief uh, observations about Dr. Michelle Sue Dewar, Mickey, the historian, the colleague, the wife to David, the mother to Susanna and Sam, and of course, friend to so many. Mickey, originally from Melbourne, a graduate of Melbourne University, moved with her husband, Dr. David Ritchie, to her new adopted home of the Northern Territory back in 1980. And over the subsequent decades, uh, Mickey with David raised their two children, Susanna and Sam, and worked and published in the Northern Territory, and what a body of work and what a legacy she has left. Commencing in 1980, she studied teaching at Northern Territory University, then worked as a teacher in the remote Milangimbi community in Arnhem Land. She completed a PhD at the Northern Territory University in 1993. In 1994, she joined Magnet, the Museum and Art Gallery of the Northern Territory, as the museum's curator of territory history. Between the years 97 and 2007, she developed and curated that, that magnificent Cyclone Tracy exhibition, which is widely acknowledged for its healing role for those who experienced this trauma and is now a very important part of her legacy. She was also in charge of heritage management of the Lions Cottage and Fanny Bay Jail historic sites. Her books, two of her books, were shortlisted for the New South Wales Premier's History Award for Community and Regional History Prize, uh, Inside Out, A Social History of Fanny Bay Jail, and In Search of the Never Never, Looking for Australia in Northern Territory Writing. And this latter book, that, la that second title, was joint winner of the Jesse Litchfield Award for Literature in 1997. In 2007, Mickey was awarded the National Archives Frederick Watson Fellow Research Grant, and her topic was an examination of the characteristics and attributes of post-war Darwin. Uh, that paper then became a presentation given in Canberra in October 2008, uh, retitled Darwin, No Place Like Home, 
a history of Australia's northern capital in the 1950s through a study of housing, and then she became a judge uh, for future iterations of that fellowship. And continuing with that line of research, uh, she won the Top Book Award in the NT History Awards for Best Publication in Northern Territory History, and that was Darwin, No Place Like Home, again on the history of housing in the Northern Territory. She also won the Alia NT Recognition Award for curating the Barella's War, the Making of a Legend exhibition, with touring component of part of the Territory Government's Centenary at Anzac project in 2015. Other contributions have included her time as a chair of Northern Territory Place Names Committee and as a member and deputy chair of Northern Territory Government Heritage Advisory Council. In amongst all of that, somehow she found time to knock out five biographies for the Australian Dictionary of Biography. Now, three of them on Aboriginal leaders, Al Gindabu, Dakira Widapanda and Wongu. Also on the explorer and author, my author Michael Terry, and on the journalist, social, soldier and author Douglas Lockwood. Uh, and Mickey was also a regular voice broadcast on the ABC radio airwaves. A, an amazing legacy, which brings me, of course, to, to my personal uh, connection with Mickey around her work on the National Archives of Australia Advisory Committee uh, Council. And that, her term on that council spanned nine years, from 2008 up to 2017. And so it's, it's the recognition of her work as an eminent historian and her tremendous contributions to and advocacy for the National Archives that we've established this annual Dr Mickey Dewar oration. As I say, Mickey was a very high, highly valued member of the Advisory Council for the National Archives of Australia. And I have some thoughts that I've, I've um, received from her colleagues on the council that served with her. And I've, I've asked if I could pass those thoughts on here today. Um, a long time council colleague is Professor John Williams, Pro Vice Chancellor at Adelaide University. Uh, and he invited me to share these thoughts. So I'm reading, I'm reading for, for John Williams here. Mickey Dewar was small in stature, but enormous in character and courage. My first meeting at the Advisory Council had the distinction of nearly being my last. The threatened closure of the State and Territory Officers of the Archives meant that Adelaide and Darwin for the first slated for this short-sighted decision. As morning tea commenced at that fateful meeting, Mickey and I huddled together and started to compose our resignation statements. Ultimately, though, we foreshadowed that prospect and got to work in changing the decision. Mickey was in her element when she was fighting for what was right and just. John continues, colour and movement are synonymous with any description of Mickey. Her striking hats and attire heralded at a distance the arrival of a warm and tender personality. Not for her a perfunctory, how are you? Mickey generously inquired after individuals, their family, pets and research, often in that order. For Mickey, it was the person that mattered and she kept those memories very close. Amongst all the comradeship, Mickey was a serious and dedicated scholar. She had a lightness of touch as she wove the history of place with the narrative of her people. The idea of place, be it beaches of Melbourne, Darwin and its environment, or policy related to housing was central to her writing. Mickey's work had a cinematic quality to it. She placed people in the landscape and told their stories. Consistent with seeing the bigger picture, her anecdotes and stories rarely situated herself in the centre. She had a keen eye for the ridiculous and gleefully punctured the egos of the self-righteous or mean-spirited. Mickey's affection for the written word and research was only eclipsed by the love of her family and her friends. We all knew of the progress of her children and the love of her husband. She had immense pride in their achievements and the principled way they approached life. Those thoughts from John Williams. Uh, the Chair of the Council, Dr Denver Beanland, also just this brief uh, remark, if you'll, if you'll let me relay these. So from Denver Beanland, on behalf of the Council, he wishes to acknowledge the wonderful contribution made by Mickey to the memories of the nation. She was a delight to work with as a team player. She contributed to major Council issues, such as, and this is a really fundamental change that she, she made, to the, the changes to the legislation, the Archives Act, 
which is allowed for the record access period. Once upon a time we had a 30-year rule, I think we're all familiar with the 30-year rule. Uh, Mickey's advocacy reduced that down to 20 years, so that's 10 years sooner that Australians can enjoy access to the records of the nation. Everyone valued Mickey's insights and understanding of the issues, and she is very sadly missed by the council. For me, it was always her, her counsel that she provided. She was pragmatic, but she was also very altruistic. She cared very passionately, not so much for the bureaucratic machinations of a national institution. She cared about the public and how they were going to engage with and enjoy the collection. It was always the people first. And so these, these observations, I think, best sum up Mickey. Her passion for history, her commitment to sharing archives with Australia, and her genuine interest in the welfare of colleagues and friends. And so now, on that note, if you would allow me to invite Dr David Ritchie, uh, Mickey's husband, to share a few words on behalf of, he, of your family, David, if you wouldn't mind coming to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I am absolutely overwhelmed to be here and to look out at you all. And, um, and thank you for those wonderful words and, 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 uh, and um, from hearing from John. I, I was, uh, she was, you know, had a, had a, um, a special uh, relationship with him and uh, had done a lot. They, did, you know, they worked very well together. And um, yeah. Okay. Uh, of all the honours that have been bestowed on Mickey, this is, I think, the one that she would have found most meaningful and been most touched by. She valued the good opinion of her colleagues on the Archives Council, but perhaps more centrally, she believed that the work of the Archives Council is central to understanding who we are, both as the Territory and as a nation. She believed that the kilometres of records generated by the system of the state for public purposes, linearly, disinterestedly, and largely for control, can be fi a fine-grained source of sound historical narrative, scalable from individual and personal to analysing national identity. The thing is, of course, this only works if the archive is accessible. The approach taken to the records of the stolen generation uh, illustrates this, and Mickey regarded it as a, a major achievement with, as David said, that the 20-year um, uh, uh, rule uh, took over from the 30-year uh, the, the rule, and that it had um, a, um, implications for the, uh, the accessibility to the, the um, records of the um, Australian Repatriation Commission. Um, she was looking forward to doing some work in that area, I know. Mickey also believed that those of us with the capability to read the stories that emerge from these records have an ob obligation to immerse ourselves in those records, to be witness to those past events and to tell those stories. And she devoted her professional life to that purpose. So, um, on behalf of the family, I thank Dr. Denver Beanland, Chair, and Mickey's colleagues on the National Archives Advisory Council for conceiving of this most fitting honour. David Fricker, Director General, Phyllis Williams, NT Regional Manager for arranging this absolutely wonderful event. A good friend, Claire Martin, for agreeing to speak to us, and all of you for coming, sorry, <laughs> to speak to us. And all of you, and particularly Josie Petrie, who's come all the way up from Alice Springs, um, for being with us to it this evening and making this a wonderful, wonderful event. So thank you. Well, thank you, David, and thank you, David, and thank you, Christy, and thank you, Tibby. And um, I too would have liked to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Darwin region and thank Tibby for his welcome to country. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the Council of the National Archives for establishing this annual oration in memory of our friend and colleague, Vicky. It is a wonderful tribute, as David said, 
and it totally recognises that Mickey was an archives tragic. She loved research, and it was the quality of that research and her commitment to it that established her reputation as a fine historian and a storyteller. Thanks as well to all of you for being here tonight. I look around, everyone sitting here, I think I know half of you, and I'm absolutely delighted that you've come along to celebrate Mickey tonight. I also want to recognise David, and in their absence, Sam, Susanna, Ed, and the awesome little Teddy. Mickey's enthusiasm, warmth, intelligence, and sense of humour touched so many lives. From her colleagues on the Archives Council to the fellows at the Qantas Hangar, her workmates on the fifth floor at the university or in the library, to fellow dog walkers at Lee Point, and to the women she would knit with occasionally on a Sunday afternoon, and welcome the knitters this afternoon today. In this oration, which I've called Telling the Territory Stories, and I thought, what a boring title. If only it was Mickey who was here to find me a really good one. So apologies, David, which I have called Telling the Territory Stories. I want to remember Mickey's contribution to the exploration and explanation of the Territory's history. Telling our story, or telling our stories, because Mickey brought so many of them to life over her 37 years living and working here in Darwin. And so I want to celebrate that this evening. But I also want to spend some time this evening challenging the major stories we now tell about ourselves, the major narratives of the Territory, and ask whether we've become too comfortable with them. And is it time to rework that narrative, shake it up a bit, expand it? Have we overlooked key Territory stories that should be told, stories that are of our past, but still current and developing? But first to Mickey, her professional life, what she did and why she did it in her own words. She wrote this a while ago. In my time in the North, I've had wonderful jobs, working as a researcher, teacher, writer, political advisor, thank you, Mickey, librarian and curator. I have presented and published many articles, books and reports on Northern Territory history, literature, politics, heritage and collections development. I am passionate about the stories from the Territory's social and political history and committed to promoting a more complex and nuanced understanding of our region within the national discourse. And that's what Mickey did. She was both a serious academic and a great storyteller and made the Territory's social and political history better understood and valued and importantly come alive. Mickey was a wonderful storyteller. It didn't matter where, at a dinner party, around a board table, in a lecture theatre, live on radio, or sitting in her kitchen over a pot of tea. Her stories were colourful, funny, full of personal anecdotes and well-researched facts. Indeed, she was such a good storyteller that I imagine that if pressed, she could have matched it with the best of the territory's tall tale tellers and we've certainly had a notorious few of those. And I have no doubt that she would have com comfortably held the crowd in even the most raucous pub. And I don't know whether she ever did. Did she? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Not official. Not official, okay. <laughs> Let me take you back now to 2010. Mickey was doing an interview on ABC Radio here in Darwin. It was Dr Mickey Dewar, the freelance historian. And she began by talking, the challenge, talking about the challenges of doing research before the arrival of the laptop and the modem. Microfish she described as a shocker, mostly because she had to resort to taking anti-sea sickness tablets to prevent microfish motion sickness. It was those tiny little photos on the page that were the culprit. However, she was much more nostalgic about her early days researching in our archives. She said, when you went to the Northern Territory Archives Service, there was no proper listing. So you had to go to these cards that were about half an A4 size and actually look for handwritten stuff. They had what you would call back numbering and you'd trace the file back to the original. You could actually find stuff that no one had seen since say 1932. So your chances of turning up something that no one had seen before were really good. She added that now researching online wasn't such an adventure and that the outcomes for a, for a researcher could be much more predictive. 
When I was rereading some of Mickey's books in preparing for this oration, her commitment to research so she could actually tell territory stories was so apparent. The Black War in Arnhem Land, published in 1992, Inside Out in 1999, and Darwin No Place Like Home in 2010. The extent of her research fills page after page of references and bibliography, evidence of long hours of detective work undertaken with great delight in the archives here and in Canberra. And that detective work over the best part of four decades told us important stories about the territory's often unknown and complex history, about the people, the policies, the politics, the recover from recovery from disasters like war and cyclones, and how that past has shaped our present and will shape our future. So now I'd like to delve into some of those key stories that Mickey told us, especially through her writings and curation of exp 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 exhibitions. I'll have some water. <laughs> her book, The Black War in Arnhem Land, Missionaries and the Yongnyu, 1908 to 1940, is exactly one of those events in our history about which Mickey wanted to promote a more complex and nuanced understanding and show how those events fitted into a national context. In 1932 and 33, there were eight murders in Arnhem Land, an area that had been gazetted by the Commonwealth as Aboriginal land the year before. Five of those killed were Japanese Tripang fishermen, one was a territory policeman, and the other two, men from Sydney and Tasmania, travelling in a small open boat from Darwin through to Thursday Island. For a time, these killings by the Yolnu in the north of the country captured national attention and provoked much and often inflammatory public discussion. So much so, the newspapers began referring to the events as the Black War. While the killing of Police Constable McColl and the trial of the man accused of his murder Takia Wirapanda has over time taken on a legal status of its own. The social and political events that led to those killings were research triggers for Mickey. As she tells us in the preface to the book, Mickey thought her research would be purely in the archives, but as luck would have it, one of the key players in the events at Callendon Bay and Wooda Island was still alive, and Mickey was able to regularly share a cup of tea with former Tripang fisherman Fred Gray as he recalled his years in Arnhem Land. In her words, for an oral historian, it was the ideal position, as I was able to interview, research, check, and confirm Mr. Gray's account of events. Where there were conflicting versions, I could go back and present these to Mr. Gray for comment. Fred also introduced Mickey to Connie Bush, who as a young girl lived and worked on a mission on Groot Island. So Connie's recollections of her childhood could be incorporated into the picture Mickey was pulling together of life in Arnhem Land in the 1930s. Mickey's meticulous research explores the reasons for this so-called Black War. We get a vivid insight into the effect of government policy of the day, of missionary presence and its impact on the lives of Aboriginal people, and of the interactions between the Yolnu and the Tripang fishermen. The description around the killings, the response of the authorities, the expedition to find the culprits, and the subsequent trial of Takia, the verdict of which was overturned in the High Court, and then his subsequent unexplained disappearance, brings these significant <coughs> events to life. But while these killings took place 90 years ago in a remote part of the country, the ramifications nationally were far-reaching. As Mickey shows, they were a turning point for our country. They triggered the start of a national discussion about Aboriginal people, about their relationship with the land, their laws and beliefs, and their interaction with the legal system. Takiyar versus the King became a landmark, landmark judgment of the High Court, raising many issues about legal ethics regarding instructions by judges, the behaviour of Defence Council, and the treatment of Aboriginal people in our courts. Mickey's research and analysis of these events shows this story, this territory story, has an important place in the national historical discourse. And just as a postscript to that story, you might remember, back in 2003, an act of reconciliation took place here in Darwin at the Supreme Court 
Between descendants of Tuckia's family, there were almost 200 of them, and 38 descendants of Constable McColl. The Chief Justice of the High Court, Murray Gleeson, presided, and the ceremony was one of the most moving events that I think many of us had ever attended. Next, I want to take you to Darwin of the post-war period, when life was tough and housing was desperately needed. And it's Tamiki's award-winning story, Darwin, No Place Like Home. I remember her telling me she was embarking on a new history project, housing in Darwin in the 1950s. My first reaction that was that this was a bit of a dry subject for my dynamic friend, but Mickey's thinking was way ahead of me. She knew that this was going to be a really good story and that giving it the narrative of housing really was the way to tell it. Her premise was, the people who came to Darwin in the post-war period were for the most part homeless, landless and disenfranchised. The story of how they found shelter and how they saw themselves, of the town that grew from the camps and hovels they squatted in as tenants, and of the political institutions and lobby groups that formed as a result, is the subject of my research. So as you can see, much more than housing. In this story, all three of Mickey's historical drivers come together, the political and social history of the time, and our positioning in the national discourse. Mickey wrote this book, as David told us, supported by two fellowships, the Frederick Watson Fellowship from the National Archives in 2007 and the National Museum Directors Fellowship of 2008. Phyllis Williams recalls Mickey arriving at the archives thoroughly organised, full of enthusiasm for the deep dive she was planning into the documents and papers of Darwin post-war, and dived she did. The end notes, references and bibliography in Darwin, No Place Like Home, comprise a third of the publication. Mickey describes, dissects and analyses Darwin of the 1950s. Her story is full of detail, colourful descriptions and a tangible sense of how life was for so many living in this city in that decade. There were two broad categories of citizens. A small number of senior public servants living in elevated houses on spacious blocks doing their two year stint. And then there was the rest. The ordinary folk of this multicultural and multiracial town. That majority was living in corrugated iron huts in camps like Belson or Parap, often with no water, sewerage, power, private kitchens or bathrooms. What is fascinating about this period in Darwin is that despite harsh conditions, appalling housing and an inadequate government administration, many remember this decade very positively and with great nostalgia. Strong communities were formed by those hardships that ignored race and colour. Circumstances and shared poverty brought people together. Social lives were built around all variety of entertainments, lots of sport, music that reflected Aboriginal, Pacific Island and Asian influences, and dancing from ballroom to rock. Darwin people, Mickey says, had a good time. They partied hard and drank vast quantities of alcohol. The weather was warm and the town was free and easy. But as her research reveals, the 1950s was about more than people surviving in tough circumstances. Agitation for political change grew quickly. Attitudes were hardening towards Canberra and a Darwin identity was being formed that combined a renegade spirit and strong parochialism. Mickey reminds us that in the steps towards political autonomy and self-government of the Northern Territory, the grassroots actions by its citizens at that time in banding together to facilitate social change have somehow been forgotten. It's salutary to remember that significant political changes were taking place among the people of the camps and huts, and that their actions brought about a more just society with greater equality, democracy and sharing of resources. So Darwin in the 1950s was not just about surviving tough circumstances or wanting better political representation. People wanted a greater fairness and justice for their multiracial community. Mickey was most certainly right about her housing story. 
The Darwin we are today has its roots in those years, and even those of us who didn't live here at the time seem to have absorbed some of its enduring spirit. Now, back in my early years as the member for Fanny Bay, I was door knocking a resident in Allen Street, directly behind the Fanny Bay Jail. He'd been there all of his life, and as a kid, he remembered watching prisoners climb over the wall in the dark, heading out for the night, but returning before dawn. <laughs> it seemed an improbable story. But after reading Mickey's History of the Fanny Bay Jail, called Inside Out and published in 1999, I decided it was probably true. The jail had a notorious reputation for harshness, but ironically also one for informality and freedom. Mickey wrote Inside Out when she was the curator of territory history and regional museums at the Museum and Art Gallery here in Darwin, and managing the Fanny Bay Jail was one of her tasks. Again, Mickey's research was wide-ranging, masses of official documents and records in the archives, although to her disappointment, war, cyclones and administrative sloppiness had left some gaps. The newspapers of the day were vital for their reports of crimes, punishments, community attitudes and commentary. And then there were the oral histories. So many people, like my constituent, who had clear memories of the jail and the activities in and around that institution. <coughs> Fanny Bay Jail opened in 1883, and for 96 years, it was the tangible symbol of law and order in the Northern Territory. In telling its story, Mickey described who was jailed, why they were jailed, what jail conditions were like, the work prisoners did, the punishments, and the occasional executions that took place, the last of which was 1952. The Chinese were locked up for smoking and trafficking opium, Aboriginal people often for being in prohibited areas. Prisoners were there for crimes of violence and murder. In the Depression, men were jailed for riding the rail. Drunkenness was common, and famously, a bunch of unionists led by Harold Nelson ended up in there as well. It was 1921 when Harold and 19 others, including the mayor, were locked up for not paying their taxes. No taxation without representation was their campaign against the Commonwealth. For this star-studded group of prisoners, their incarcer incarceration was certainly not all hardship. Mickey tells us, after the leaders had been jailed at Fanny Bay, the Darwin citizenry visited the jail en masse, bringing Sunday roast lunches, <laughs> pies and jellies, and waving red flags. Outside the jail walls, the Darwin Brass Band played stirring marches. <laughs> it's a wonderful irony that jail time didn't hold Harold Nelson back. The campaign for representation was successful, and Harold became the Territory's first federal member in Canberra. Another famous inmate was the legendary Aboriginal leader, Nemaluk, convicted for killing three Japanese fishermen. He escaped for a time, but was recaptured. Historians are divided about what was his eventual fate. Did he die in Fanny Bay Jail, or was he pardoned and released? That second opinion was very possible, because in February 1942, after Darwin had been extensively bombed, Supreme Court Justice Thomas Wells was instructed by Administrator Abbott to release and pardon the 39 prisoners in Fanny Bay Jail, 19 of whom had life sentences. Judge Wells is reputed to have said to those he was releasing, among you, there are men I sentenced to long jail terms for killing Japanese pearlers. I'm letting you go. From now on, you can kill as many Japanese as you can find. <laughs> And instead, of a, and instead of a jail sentence, you will probably get a medal. <laughs> so it seems for a handful of Darwin residents, the bombings of 1942 brought unexpected opportunities. <laughs> Perhaps Nemeluk was one of them. Once again, Mickey has chosen a subject for research that might have initially been seen as quite restricted, the history of a penal institution, but not so. This inside-out story of Fanny Bay Jail is a lively social, political, and judicial history of 100 years of Darwin and the Territory. Mickey experienced the difference between working as an academic historian, writing the kind of books I've been talking about so far, and what was required of a public historian when she started her work as the history curator at the museum. 
She said the key difference was that she no, was no longer writing for an academic audience who had a professional understanding of historical issues. Instead, she was a public historian dealing with general, the general public who came to history with diverse perspectives and challengingly, and to quote her, had their own ideas about the past, formed by any number of things, what their father told them, what they'd read, what they'd seen on television, or what they believed in their hearts about the nature of the event. This difference emerged starkly for Mickey in her first curatorial task, which was the redevelopment of the Cyclone Tracy Gallery to mark 20 years since the cyclone had devastated Darwin. To do, to do that, she moved the popular old display that was installed at the Fanny Bay Jail and built a new exhibition at the museum. The move did not go unnoticed by the general public, as Mickey later reflected. OK, she said. So the letters to the paper, radio stories, news items, political comment, staff complaints, and members of the public weeping to me were a surprise. But a big chunk of me liked it a lot. Even if people were abusing me, at least they were engaging with interpretations of the past in a passionate and vigorous way. It was with some amusement and much satisfaction that Mickey watched her new cyclone gallery shed its controversial beginnings and become, along with the iconic Sweetheart, the most visited exhibit at the museum. Mickey once described the gallery's status as like a shrine that could never be changed or updated. 24 years on, there have been some small changes, but the Cyclone Tracy Gallery is very much how it was in 1994, an exhibition that tells the cyclone story through art, artefacts and architecture. The sound room is still eerie, midnight mass mixing with Tracy's winds at the Catholic Cathedral, and the press button accounts by locals of that night are still as fresh as they were when they were first told. Even though it's now over 40 years since Cyclone Tracy wreaked its havoc on Darwin, causing death and destruction in our city, it's very possible that for many people outside the Territory, that event is still the strongest image they have of us, one of the few things they actually know about us. That on Christmas Day in 1974, Darwin was blown away by a cyclone called Tracy. The other big story about Darwin is also death about death and destruction, the bombings of 1942, which destroyed the city and killed scores of citizens. For years, little was known about these World War II events, but that's changing. The story is slowly growing in stature and national significance, especially the commemoration each year on the 19th of February. Tourists and locals can now immerse themselves in the stories of that period through visiting our defence and military museums and inspecting some of the physical remains from World War II, the remaining buildings at East Point Reserve and the old storage tunnels in town. There's no doubt that the story of the bombing of Darwin is a very powerful one. So is the story of the cyclone. It's not surprising then that our tourist operators are running successful tours that focus on both these stories with their common theme of destruction. And again, there's no doubt that these two important stories for our city are two important stories for our city. But my concern is that there is so much more to Darwin and the Territory than two events of destruction, one through war, the other through natural disaster. Both took terrible tolls on our city and its citizens. And that, of course, should never be forgotten. And those stories will continue to be told and respected. But I would like to suggest that we expand our Darwin and Territory narrative. And if you want to be inspired how that can happen, take a look at the new exhibition at the State Library. It's called A Territory Story. Mickey was very much involved in its development. And while it recognised cyclone and war, it shows that those events are part of a much more complex and broader sweep of Territory history, starting tens of thousands of years ago and running through to the latest provocative NT News headline. Two of the stories featured in this exhibition are ones that we should be telling more fully and more confidently. Both stories unique to the Territory and both are stories that have shaped the Territory we are today. So what are these stories? Well, I'm putting in my bid for the story of the Territory's self-government and the story of Aboriginal land rights, both of them immense and long-lasting achievements for the Northern Territory. 
For 100 years, no new government had been established in Australia until ours was in 1978. And after land rights legislation was introduced in the Territory in 1976, no other jurisdiction was prepared to make the same recognition of Aboriginal Australians' relationship and rights to land. I'm not pretending that self-government and land rights were straightforward events to manage for the Territory, that there was some kind of smooth trajectory, not at all. Being a self-governing self Territory has over its 40 years, to put it kindly, had some ups and downs. And land rights at times has been at the centre of bitter and long-lasting divisions in our community. But that does not lessen the importance of telling these two stories both to ourselves and to the rest of Australia. Mickey and I together I wrote about a territory self-government journey in our book, Speak for Yourself, published here by CDU in 2012. We both found it fascinating to learn firsthand about the challenges and successes of the first eight territory governments, told from the perspective of the eight chief ministers, myself included. The book's primary focus is on what it was like to be a chief minister leading a government that did not have full independence or full powers to on its own affairs, that upper hand being held by the Commonwealth. So the relationship between chief ministers and success of Australian governments was crucial. Sometimes that relationship was smooth and mature, other times full of tensions and provocations. Our second chief minister, Ian Tuxworth, felt that there was a conspiracy to collapse the territory system. This was in the Hawke years. So the Commonwealth could, say, could take it back and say that we should never have gone down that road in the first place and that self-government was a bad mistake. Our third Chief Minister, Steve Hatton, reckoned that the Commonwealth, even a decade after self-government, was treating the Territory like an authority of the Federal Government, and that their overriding view of us was, bloody Territory, they're all cowboys. However, our first Chief Minister, Paul Everingham's big challenge with the Commonwealth, was negotiating, negotiating the terms of self-government. He remembers there were essentially no rules or guidelines for those negotiations, and that he and Marshall Perham pretty much figured it out for themselves. He recalls endless meetings, back and forth, Darwin and Canberra, being on aeroplanes, wearing the Commonwealth down, and somehow managing to twist Malcolm Fraser's arm. That first challenge out of the way, there were so many more things to be tackled by our first Territory Government, ranging from a public service who Everingham considered had a work ethos, ethos of, how we can stop you doing, of how we can stop you getting something done, to a still sceptical population who wasn't sure about this self-government thing, to tackling the conditions of the Aboriginal communities. Everingham describes this legacy, legacy from the Commonwealth as pretty disgraceful. But while the burden of a new government was substantial, Everingham, who was only 35 years at the time, saw opportunities. If I were called upon to name the single most attractive feature of territory politics at this time, he said, I would say it lay in a lack of precedent, the freedom of choice left to the new government, as it makes policy decisions on matters settled in other parts of Australia. There's so much more to this story of self-government, and it's definitely not a boring or tedious one. The personalities, the problems, the conflicts, the politics, the frustrations, but importantly, the achievements are all there. And so are all our chief ministers, now up to 11 in number. They're all alive and well. But I often wonder how different our self-government story might have been in 1975 if the ter Territory had taken up Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser's offer of statehood in five years. At the time, the political energy was focused on challenges of negotiating self-government, so the offer was allowed to lapse. In retrospect, it was a real shame. Malcolm Fraser recognised that and told me much later on that he felt the Territory had been disadvantaged by not being a state, and he was sorry that he had not insisted on statehood at the time. The Territory's land rights story intersects with the story of self-government, but this is a narrative that needs to be told in its own right. The land came process in the Territory is where for me, many years legitimate Aboriginal aspiration and political rhetoric and opportunity collided. Excluded from being a player in the land came process because the Land Rights Act was Commonwealth law, successive Territory governments used the threat of claims as a political wedge. 
Usually it was the territory's development or our lifestyle that was under threat. Think the handover of Uluru, the bitter debate around Coronation Hill, mining, fishing and access to waterways, or even the prospect of a suburban backyard under claim. But despite the years of intense political attacks on the Land Rights Act and the land claim process, there has been a remarkable level of success for Aboriginal Territorians because 50% of the Territory's land and coastline has been returned to them, is Aboriginal land. And although the struggle for many Aboriginal groups has been a long and difficult one, there have been iconic events along the journey, from the bark petitions sent to Canberra by the Yolngu, the walk-off at Wave Hill led by Vincent Lingiari, the Woodward Commission and its recommendations that formed the basis of the Land Rights Act, and then since that time, the holding of so many joyous handback ceremonies all throughout the Territory, as land has been returned to traditional owners. My guess is that very few non-Aboriginal Territorians know much about land rights at all, or if they do, it's framed by where they can't go or a permit they need. And mostly, I think, that's because the Territory still has a highly transient population. So my argument is this evening that the Territory has two unique and important stories that we should be telling, both to Territorians and to our visitors. Because as I see it, self-government and land rights have more profoundly influenced and defined who we are than any other events over the past 40 years. I'd like to finish this evening by thanking the National Archives and its Council for this invitation to deliver the inaugural Dr. Mickey Dewar uh, oration. It's been my privilege to be the inaugural orator. It's also given me the opportunity to spend time with my friend Mickey, rereading her stories of our social and political history, appreciating her fine skills as a researcher and an historian, and having the time to think about just how those stories have given us a better understanding of this complex, sometimes difficult, but wonderful territory of ours. Thank you. Now, uh, the intimidating moment for me, because there's nothing like uh, interviewing a former journalist uh, to unnerve you, so uh, <laughs> bear with me, and I hope that uh, plenty of you out there can do some of this uh, heavy lifting for me uh, in the form of asking questions. So uh, this microphone is actually for those of you who, who may have <coughs> questions. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Um, it just uh, resonates very deeply with me, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think as a journalist, we uh, very much see that the, the stories that get the tractional interest are the, the Cyclone Tracys and the bombing of Darwin, and there is so much more uh, to the Territory, as you have pointed out, and uh, I certainly hope that we can continue to push to have those uh, important moments of history on the national agenda through what I do. Uh, Am I allowed to interfere now? You're allowed to do okay. whatever you want. <laughs> Can I just apologise for, apologize for my cold tonight? Like many of you, I think the flu is kind of attacking us. But anyway, I, on the stories that I think we should be having told, I mean, I know that people are really sceptical about governments and self-government and that kind of thing. And if you've been around a fair time, you have views of who were chief ministers and who you liked and who you didn't, what policies you didn't. But I think it's time to wind it back to the actual fact of setting up a government, setting up all the elements of a government, and looking at, honestly, what we've achieved, what we haven't achieved, and that trajectory since, well, before 1978, but certainly from 1978. And I just think the opportunity with our chief ministers still all alive and reasonably well and really reasonably compassmentous that we should be further telling that story and at least explaining to Territorians where we've come from in such a short time. If we had a current Chief Minister of your calibre, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and Michael Gunner. <laughs> I'd like to open up. Is there anyone on the floor that would like to ask a question? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, Barbara James was another a uh, very well-known researcher, historian, who wrote about women of the Northern Territory, contributed 
in the political sphere as well. Was there much collaboration between Barbara and uh, Dr. Mickey Dewan? Yeah, there was. They were they were very good mates, and they they were both historians working on territory stories, and uh, often Mickey could be seen at, at Barbara's place. So um, yeah, I mean they both shared that real passion for telling the stories of the territory, Barbara's particularly about territory women, and Mickey just about a kind of amazing range of territory stories. Yes, Dr. David. <laughs> I'm allowed to do it. Foreign countries, another territory, the ACP. <laughs> I'm very interested, Claire, in that the story about self government and your reference to Malcolm Fraser's contemplation of statehood. Do you think that story of self government does still end in statehood for the territory? And what do you think is, how is that story developing? Well, I think if I went round the room, there'd probably be divided opinions about statehood. Okay, who's for statehood? Who's not? The rest of you. Right. <laughs> See what I mean, David? Um, I mean, we had it tilted it, and it, it, did, it failed. And um, I don't see that Territorians have that same um, interest in statehood. But one of the reasons I think, I mean, I'm a very strong advocate for statehood. Um, and I just think that we are not in a much better negotiating position in Australia if we're a state than if you're a territory. I mean, it's physically very obvious being a, a, a territory. You go to COAG where everyone gets together, the states and the territories and the prime minister, the states sit on one side of the table and the territories and the prime minister sit on the other. I mean, we are visibly second class citizens. Um, I just think that if we start telling the story of statehood, of um, self-government, we've got more of a chance of people understanding what the trajectory is and why we should be thinking about moving to a state. I mean, some of the, some of the stories that previous chief ministers talking about trying to deal with the Commonwealth, with all due respect to somebody from Canberra, um, are really, look, that, it's just ridiculous how we were treated. Maybe we deserve some of it, but not all of it. <laughs> Oh, it's all down to representation, Michael. It is. I mean, if you, you can't be as effective if you don't have that same number of senators. In the House of Reps, no, not so much, but those senators, Tasmania is far more kind of powerful in that sense because it has a full complement of senators. I mean, chief, one chief minister after chief minister talking about virtually being voiceless in Canberra. Please feel free to interrupt, uh, <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> I guess on land rights, Claire, because I know that, of course, was your other uh, main topic you want to point out, there is, you know, the view that Indigenous people do have to be involved in, st in telling their own stories. And I guess uh, Mickey probably made that one of her passions to have that involvement. But, I mean, how are we going on that front and, and what work is needed to be done to make sure that Indigenous people are part of that storytelling process and, and historical recognition? I think we've moved a long way since the beginning of the Land Rights Act and how Ab Aboriginal people would like, I'm, you know, and I'm not being an authority here, but my sense is that Aboriginal Territorians would like to tell the story of land rights. They would like to explain to those of us who don't know the relationship between land and culture and land rights. And, uh, and I, I see a growing interest in doing that. Um, we really don't tell that story. It's a unique territory story, and it has been, to say the least, bloody over the years. But we have reached a much better place now, and I think that um, it's time for the story to be told. Up the back. Travellers, when we had a chance for statehood, we wanted statehood, not stonewood. <laughs> <laughs> we blew it. We blew it. We did. He blew it. Yeah, but that doesn't mean at some stage, whereas in the future, we shouldn't try again. You do? Oh, great. <laughs> One more for statehood. <laughs> I, 
Okay, I'm just going to, on that, I mean, the opportunity to the state is we, there has not been a constitution developed since 1901. <laughs> I mean, to have a, a constitution that was, a, that was an artifact of the 21st century would be amazing. Oh, look, we, we had a, a bit of a, a try at it back in the 90s, but um, to actually do it now would be very significant, wouldn't it? I think it would be uh, maturing, which would be great. And uh, I just think that to be a territory, I often contemplate how we're viewed in the rest of Australia. And I think that often we're a blank slate. I think that other Australians can kind of quickly accept anything that is said about us. And I know some terrible things happen, but when you look at the latest master branding exercise and what other Australians said about us, it's pretty daunting. I mean, they think we're the Wild West. I mean, they think there's nothing here. Why would you come here? Because there's nothing here. So we really have to do a lot better in telling our story and, uh, and looking at some of the things that we need to put in place to do that. And I think recognition of things that are uniquely Territorian is part of that. So that's how we, put a, how we did self-government, how we put governments together. And it certainly is land rights. I might have to start putting people on the spot shortly. Uh, Julia Christensen, who's a far better interviewer than I, I'm sure. You have any, anything for Claire? Well, Claire, you have been a little provocative this evening, so I might be provocative in return. And you're you know, wanting to put these stories forward. And for the Northern Territory to make its mark in the national kind of news sphere, there really needs to be a crocodile. So how can we get the story of the crocodiles into self-government and land rights? That's my question. <laughs> oh, Julia. That's your task, Claire. I think both these stories need the kind of, you need to step back and look at how we would tell them. Um, I look at tourists who come to Darwin, and they go and they do tours they enjoy, which talk about the destruction of our city. It hit me the other day and I thought, you're all heading off and you're just going to be told stories about how the bombing of Darwin destroyed us. And then you're going to be told the other story about how a cyclone destroyed us. What kind of image does that give people who visit here? Um, I think we would have to think very carefully about how we told those stories so we didn't kind of, you know, need a crocodile to make them interesting. But I think they're interesting in their own right. Oh, we've got some great themes about survival, about resilience, um, and and why shouldn't we try and tell those stories so that the we understand them ourselves, but also people outside the Territory understand them as well. There's lots of other ones. I'm sure other people could add stories to this. Up the back, please. Um, Claire, it's interesting that the Archives is currently conducting a, an oral history project around self-government. Um, one of the interesting aspects of Northern Territory history is how few people actually seem interested in writing it. You mentioned land rights and you think about all of the Aboriginal organisations that have grown since self-government. There are no organisational, very few organisational histories. We don't celebrate uh, the Aboriginal health services. There's so many stories that aren't being told and uh, seemingly a, a relatively low interest in doing so. What do you think we can do to encourage people to be writing their own stories? I think people should be writing their own stories, but maybe we could encourage government to put some uh, fellowships out or things to actually encourage territory people to, uh, to look at those stories. I think um, Oh, well, let's put the pressure on the university too, since we're sitting here. <laughs> yeah, I was Sorry. thinking, you know, uh, I think your words talking about writing stories, and I was at the talk at CDU, uh, just a week ago at the Darwin Festival that you were at, Claire, and there were the first um, three uh, first presenters were Aboriginal uh, people saying, we want to tell our own story. We don't want 
everybody else telling our story, but they come from an oral history, not a written history. So maybe we have to think about how we want these stories told. I think Spun's got a long way to get people out there telling their stories, which are often stories of the territory, but doing it in a different, in a different way, and it's had impact. Put it onto Ruth Wallace. Ruth Wallace, I'm being asked. Uh, I'll <laughs> happily sum it up you. <laughs> it's all about revenge, Claire. No, it's not. <laughs> um, I, was I was having a conversation with Bill Ronnie today because she's developing her Valaricia language project to try and bring language back. And one of the things we were talking about was signposts. So I was, wanted to, so I was, I was thinking about how do we have the naming or the you know, the more metaphorical signposts that start people's conversations about what this is and what it means. So when the tour guide drives down Salonica Street, they're actually talking about that history, you know, great pioneering history, rather than just one version of history that's been put forward. And I just wonder if you had the thoughts on that part. Um, I've also talked to, to uh, Bill Awara about how we simply don't recognise at all well the Larrick here being traditional owners of this country. Um, there is a lot of discussion going on around at least welcome, to, welcome signs to town, saying welcome to Larrakia country. Um, there's other options of things that can be done, but I think that, you know, there is, there is more to be done, but I think we have to start those conversations. But to write the history, maybe CDU could look at some fellowships. That's what I was getting at. <laughs> Yeah. But I think it goes beyond what we're thinking about. I think we have to think a bit more about the different ways we can point signs to ask the question about this or why these names keep coming up. I think we can start to be a bit more proactive. Well, we just simply quickly refer that to the chair of the Place Names Committee. <laughs> convenient. Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a starting point, though? Yes. Um, so the Place Names Committee is currently absolutely looking at um, a whole series of, um, of names. The Chief Minister has been quite um, outspoken in wanting to start looking at more dual naming, and that's something the Place Names Committee is completely behind. The, um, we'd also like to start looking at a fancy place name. Now, I know there's been a little bit of uh, talk on social media recently about the proposal to uh, rename Barnes and Boulevard, which at the moment is not actually an official name. So Barnes and Boulevard, Boulevard is a working, a working name for that, uh, for that, for that road. And the idea is that uh, our care of the proposed uh, 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 Road, Boulevard Street is still something that there's, needs to go through the process at least before, before that happens. But in terms of offensive names, there's names that are both recorded names and registered names that we really do need to see got rid of, but there, there's some names, you know, Blackwell Creek, Nigga Creek, names like that that we'll be getting rid of. We're also very, very interested in dual naming. The place names process is that it comes from the component of the uh, of the development that is happening. So it doesn't really come <coughs> from government, it doesn't come from the place names committee, it comes from the proponent of the development, so, or it comes from the people. So if people have a place, have a name that they would like to see commemorated, they need to send that into the place names committee. So we're doing all this work around how to make that easier, how to make that more obvious about the way the processes work, and we're absolutely uh, very, very uh, key to start seeing some dual naming of geographic features. Mainly, we're sort of looking at what's happening in other jurisdictions, and uh, to, to see to see that to see that happen. So if you want to. <laughs> Everyone watching the Place Names Committee tomorrow will be very happy to see some <laughs> suggestions around, around naming. Thank you. That, sorry, Sam, but that was a terrific explanation. There'll be so many letters coming this week. Oh, this is what I like to see. We'll start with this lady at the front. Amazing. Um, so, one of the stories that I think is really important, and it goes back before the land rights, um, act and Aboriginal people being reconnected to their land is a story of the stolen generations of peoples, the Northern Territory children who were actually physically taken away from their, their mothers, their country and their culture. And that's a story that's not been written and that 
talks about survival and resilience of those people who are still alive today, but the effects that that has had on their children and their grandchildren, and all the intergenerational trauma and even the behaviour of our children today stems right back from there. And they're the stories that should be told. And the anti style of generations that Aboriginal Corporation is actually working on the history of, of these stolen generations so that those people who stayed here, who, who were taken away, but came back as, um, and they have been away from their parents for 19 years, you know, some of them saw their mothers again. But they came to Darwin, they made Darwin, and they raised their families in it there. So, you know, when we talk about land rights, we talk about survival and resilience, we need to let other people know that there is another story there about the stolen generations people. Because a lot of people don't believe that there was such a, an episode in our history. And absolutely, you're right. Thank you. The gentleman at the back. Do you think if there was money available to transcribe the oral history recordings, that we'd get <coughs> them in books? Uh, are you free? <laughs> oh, I'm expensive. <laughs> I mean, all, 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 I know you are, Wes. Um, but what my intention was tonight, apart from, you know, saying what a fantastic historian Mickey was and how she wrote wonderful stories about us that were so much detail in the research, was to say, should we start looking at the stories we're telling about ourselves and the gaps that we have in those stories? And, um, you know, if anyone can think of creative ways to move this on, that, that'd be terrific. But it was just to put it out there and say, well, should we tell the story of self-government? and should be telling the story of land rights and, of course, add to that stolen generation. You can also add, uh, in the day and age, capital community. You know, when you're really interested to look at the whole of Ted, you get like two cities. If in between those two cities, you get all the hundreds of communities. They just wank, wank and society. And, you know, they're not being heard. Uh, look, I think there are enormous stories in the Territory. I thought, the, the reason I said I thought land rights was a good one to start with, because it is unique to the Territory, and it is something that every community around the Territory has their own story to tell about their land, their land claim process and their achievement of land rights if they've achieved that. So it was a, a unifying story and a very profound Territory story. 
Yes. Hi. Um, I'm a visitor here. I'm from the United States of Victoria. Um, like Don't boast. Well. <laughs> 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 uh, just a question about Nikki, because she's, she is the guest of honour here tonight, and she sounds like a really remarkable lady, and uh, she she's done such wonderful things. I just wanted to know, when she was doing all of her research, and maybe her husband can answer this, but how often did she get out of the university? Did she, did she go camping? Did she go bush? Did she go <laughs> see these people? And, and, and did she do much of that kind of thing? David? <laughs> uh, well, um, I can say that, that, that she, her, her interest in territory history came from uh, going uh, from uh, so that the old community of uh, Adam Community College, it wasn't the university then, but it's very much a, and, I, and, and, and uh, going out to, before Kakadu was even a car, out to the, uh, up to the East Alligator and out to, across into Arnhem Land, and then later she became, she taught on Miller and Gilby. Um, and that was where she, she, she discovered the kind of the background stuff that became in the White War. So, yeah, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the thing is that, that these history, and mentioning, I'm talking about Barbara James, but there, there, you have a, have a, um, uh, the, the historical side trips into back into the into the into the into the, into the um, uh, both you know, looking at you know the regular feature of our lives is going on you know trips back just to look at, at the the, um, the kind of the wreckage of failed mining kind of booms. And, and sort of the, the, uh, the, 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 the very big part of it. And I think what, what she would say is that pretty well all her insights came from actually talking to people who had been there, which she then was able to verify and talk about and challenge through the archival work. It didn't start from the archival work and go the other way. She tells this great radio story about Tennant Creek. <laughs> <laughs> so I just Google Mickey Dura and Ten Creek, I'm sure you'll maybe see you'll, you'll find it. But it's about her love. I mean I think that she did really love the regions, David, in lots of ways and for their um you know, just because they were so idiosyncratic, I think, and you know, yeah, but she thought, you know, talked a lot about that and certainly through Heritage Council had to you know, she was on Heritage Council for a long time and she had to uh, you know, know those places because lots of decisions were being made about protecting sites. Um, so she had to know about them and, and to visit and, uh, you know, either physically or through, through the archive. And she does tell the funniest stories about Tennant Creek. I mean, it took her three visits to like it. So she, <laughs> and she tells it graphically. She's very funny. <laughs> I think because it is obviously her night, perhaps uh, as we sort of come to a close, it's, it's good to bring it back uh, to this tremendous woman. Is there a little bit of you that is worried that uh, this huge uh, onus to tell our stories differently and to refocus uh, would have been done potentially by her own work? I mean, is there a large void now left and, and are you worried about who will do that work? I definitely think there's a void now that Mickey is not writing the stories she wrote. As I suggested that we might change our narrative a bit, I thought, oh, what would Mickey say? You know, she'd probably argue it with me for hours. We might end up on the same side of it. I mean, I figured that she liked a good territory story and we did do self-government together, so that couldn't have been too bad and I'm sure she would have supported the story of land rights. I think she would have. But there is a gap. I mean, we are... There's nobody who's going to be as prolific as Mickey. Um, and she has made an, enorse, an, uh, uh, an awesome uh, contribution. And uh, I suppose as a community, we have to start thinking about who's going to be someone to take on from her work, you know, to continue, continue that, because we'll lose those stories. And they're, I think they're really important to understanding who we are and where we're going. I think that's a wonderful note to end on unless anyone else has anything pressing they'd like to raise. But uh, thank you so much, Claire, Pleasure. obviously. Uh, wonderful to hear your words. And, and thank you very much. Um, thank you, David. You played a much larger part, I think, than maybe you, you thought you were going to this evening. But thank you so much for your generosity in being here tonight. and uh, and allowing us all to honour Nikki in the work that she's done. 
Um, and especially you, Claire, thank you so much for a very provocative uh, discussion. Now, can I say, as from a point of view of a memory institution, National Archives of Australia, and Marcus is here as well, uh, Shatenko from uh, Museum and Gallery, Northern Territory, others from the um, Northern Territory Archive Service, Phyllis, and others. Our Phyllis, where are you? Oh, there you are, Phyllis. Um, look, and, and what I think for me, and I hope I can speak for us in our sector, there's a case, there's a call to action here as well. You know, we in the memory institutions are ready to play our part, and you have really inspired me uh, in making sure that, you know, we do carry on the fine work of, of Mickey and, and historians. A big shout out to historians in the room, because historians make it happen, and the memory institutions provide the raw material to make that happen. So. I think, you know, for me, it was very inspirational. I think it was a really uh, great call to action for us to get moving and make sure we tell those stories. And I was also very impressed that you were saying, tell the stories here in the Territory, but to the rest of Australia as well. And that's, that's another takeaway for me. As a national institution, we've got to do this. All Australians need to hear these stories because it's an inspiration. It really is an inspiration. So thank you all of you very much once again. And please, once again, can we thank Claire Martin. And we look forward to uh, doing this again next year as we continue the Mickey Dewar oration.